Hey everybody, welcome to the Psychology of Video Games podcast. My name is Jamie Madigan and I have made it my mission in life to help people understand the intersection of psychology and video games, how psychology can be used to make better games, to understand games, and to understand what happens to players when they play games. In every episode of this podcast, I interview an expert on the intersection of psychology and games about a particular topic. This is the episode about the difficulties of doing good research on psychology and video games. I feel I should also mention that there's a website, psychologyofgames.com, and at that website you can find literally hundreds of other articles that I've written and published about the psychology of video games, as well as dozens of episodes of the podcast. You can also find information on how to subscribe to the website and the podcast, and how to contact me and follow me on various social media. You should go check it out. So back when I started doing this whole psychology of games thing back in 2009, I think it was, I wasn't really aware of a lot of scientific, peer-reviewed, high-quality research on the topic. Turns out there was a fair amount of it kicking around for sure, and I found out about it since. But it's kind of amazing how much this kind of research has exploded in the last few years. One informal analysis by Patrick O'Connor over at comicspedia.blogspot.com found a 274% increase in peer-reviewed studies about psychology and video games. That's in the last six or so years relative to the early 2000s. It's amazing and it's kind of awesome. And yet, this kind of research is hard to do. More so, I think, than research on certain basic cognitive functions or even more applied research like consumer behavior or decision making. Video games are rich experiences that people generally engage in for hours at a time across a variety of different situations. And there are many different kinds of games that vary widely in their mechanics, their demands on the player, the type of technology that they rely on, and the effects they can be expected to have on players. Studying a PC simulation game and trying to generalize your findings to a mobile phone game or a shooter played in a virtual reality headset is tricky at best and foolhardy at worst. And yet, some researchers try to do exactly that. Two areas where this kind of thing show up a lot are studies on violent video games and studies on addiction, sometimes called problematic gameplay. Not coincidentally, these are two of the biggest and frequently two of the most controversial topics among video game researchers. Some critics of this research argue that we haven't even really done the most basic of work in operationalizing our terms and widely agreeing on what we mean by them. What do we mean by aggression, for example? or addiction. And when research is done on these topics, the methodologies used are sometimes not adequate to rule out all kinds of confounding variables and alternate explanations for the results. It's tempting to say that this is just bad research or lazy researchers, but I think that totally misses the earlier point that this kind of thing is hard to do because of the nature of games and gaming experiences. That makes it no less an important topic to study, though, and it's useful to look at the limitations of the research to try to chart a path forward. That's what I'm going to do with this week's podcast guest. In particular, we're going to talk about the trickiness of studying aggression in the laboratory. There's no fear of being reprimanded for it. There's no um, social disapproval by others. So all of these contingencies that we usually have, that usually govern whether we are behaving aggressively or not, all of these contingencies, they don't exist in the laboratory. And when it doesn't even make sense to talk about addiction in games, and when it might. And that's actually the reason why, why gambling has made it, in a way, to the diagnostic manuals that we have. Um, because the harm that it causes is, is enormous. If gambling wasn't about money, if gambling was about time, maybe just, maybe there wasn't any money involved, I don't think we would be talking about it. I don't think that diagnosis would exist. Um, we have acknowledged that it's a, it's a problem and that those people need treatment because um, they're hurting themselves, they're hurting others. And the same cannot be said for video games. And after all of that, what might you want to do if you're interested in getting into studying this whole psychology of video games thing? How can you get ready for it? How can you prepare? That's coming up in just a minute. This episode of the Psychology of Games podcast is supported by, well, nobody specific. I don't really have ads on here. But what I do have is a Patreon page where you can go and help make sure that there are future episodes of the podcast by kicking a buck or two my way. It's super easy to set up. Couldn't be easier, I swear. 
And there are some neat rewards for Patreon supporters. Plus, as I hit funding goals, I'll release extra content for you to enjoy. Just go to patreon.com slash POG. That's for psychology of games, obviously. Patreon.com slash POG. All right, let's move on to the interview. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us on the interview portion of the podcast. This episode, I have Malt Elson, who is a, a researcher who does a lot of uh, research related to video games and is here to talk us, to us about some of the uh, realities of doing research on entertainment products, especially video games, and how you balance the need for scientific rigor with the realities of uh, of that kind of research and trying to answer the questions that are important to that topic. So, Malt, welcome. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hey, uh, thank you for inviting me to your podcast. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Great. So, who are you and, and what are you doing here? Right. Well, as you said, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I'm, I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Ruhr University of Bochum in Germany. Um, I work in the Educational Psychology Research Group, um, and uh, my research is... Uh, it's mostly about video games um, and uh, psychological research methods and uh, psychological um, knowledge production in a way. So how, how do uh, psychologists uh, do uh, research? How do they do science? Uh, how do they evaluate science? Uh, these are my, my, my two broad uh, research topics. You know, we, we talked a little bit offline about the concept of doing good research about video games is tricky, um, from what mm -hmm. I understand. And I, I've under, you know, talked to a lot of researchers, and they say that in you know in good research or, or at least in straightforward research, it's a lot of times you would do something like you would have two groups, two or more groups, and you would have different treatments for those groups, and so you would isolate like the okay, the only difference between these groups is the thing that I'm interested in studying, the effects of it. And so I would have one group would be the control group that I would, wouldn't do anything. And then I'd have one or more experimental groups. You know, this is research methods 101 type of stuff. Right. But then that's difficult to do in the context of video games from, from what I understand, uh, because it's sometimes difficult to have two different groups play two different video games or one group play a game and one group not. And games are such complex experiences that it's difficult to pin down like what the effect is or what exactly the treatment is you're getting or be able to say with confidence, like this group was different than the other group because of the thing that I did. So can you just kind of walk us through that type of situation that a lot of researchers encounter? Right. So um, the logic of any scientific experiment, not just in psychology, but in, in all sciences, is that you, um, you manipulate a factor uh, of interest to you um, and in, in the case of video game research, that's, for example, often um, the um, displays of violence, uh, for example. And um, so that's your, your experimental factor that you, that you manipulate. And then you have your um, outcome measure. That's the target variable that, um, that you think um, your manipula manipulation is going to have an effect on. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly simple equation. Um, on the one hand, you have this, this experimental factor, and on the other hand, you, or the predictor, uh, in a way, and on the other hand, you have the outcome variable. So, and as you, as you already um, suggested, um, with video games, um, it's not that easy because um, video games um, themselves are a quite complex stimulus. Like in basic uh, cognitive psychology, sometimes you stimuli are just words. And that's fairly easy to manipulate because, um, I mean, words can consist of multiple uh, letters. Um, but other than that, that's, that's it, right? They're, they're pretty, pretty flat um, and a pretty, uh, pretty simple stimuli. But of course, video games um, are complex, not just visually, but they also have sounds. Um, they have mechanics. They have a story and all of that. And that is... Uh, that can bring um, video game researchers um, into trouble. So um, early on, um, when video games research, uh, particularly the effects research started, which is like 25 years ago, researchers did basically what, um, what you also said. They would have had two groups. One group plays um, a video game that 
has it features the type of rival they're interested in. So, for example, they play a violent video game, and then the other group just does nothing. They they don't do anything. Um, they like literally sit there for yeah, maybe fifteen minutes or, or whatever. Yeah. Listen to some relaxed music or <laughs> right. something something that is not really um, demanding or challenging or anything like that. They would just do nothing, and then um, researchers pretty quickly figured out that that might not be um, the right way to go about it because um, although of course the one group that um, the, the, your experimental group uh, is exposed to the content that you're interested in, um, they're also exposed to a lot of other things that might or might not influence your target rival. So for example, people play um, people play a violent video game, and let's say it's a competitive one, which most of the violent video games are, and they lose, uh, they lose the game. They, they, they are exposed to the violent content, but they're all also exposed to a maybe frustrating experience. Well, the other group just does nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, and that, of course, posed a bit of a problem to researchers. Um, so they went on and um, tried to give the other group, the control group, another game to play. Um, and they were trying to, to match those games as good as possible. So make the, have two different games, one violent, for example, and the other non-violent, and make sure they are about the same level of excitement they have the same difficulty um maybe they have the same type of graphics quality the same level of, of immersion or, or narrative uh, complexity and as you can already see th there are a lot of rivals you would need to control for you know, you would need to make sure that those games are at least somewhat comparable um, to each other at one point uh, i mean you can you can come up with a long list of things that you say might be important, so those games should be fairly similar on. And um, that basically um, sort of only shifted the problem. Um, the, the essential problem from before stayed the same. One group would, would be exposed to the type of contents research that it's interested in, but also to many things the other group wouldn't be exposed to. So in a way... Um, when you have one group play um, a violent video game, let's say they play, um, let's pick let's pick a classic example, Counter Strike, and mm -hmm. the other group plays Tetris, um, and you compare those two groups for the outcome variable. So after playing, you you measure them, you measure some, let's say, um, aggressive behavior, um, right. for example. You don't really know what of those differences between the games caused differences in the outcome rival, um, which is um, a basic problem for all experimental scientists, um, um, which is the problem of experimental control or stimulus control. That, of course, um, is a problem if, you, if you're interested in studying a very specific research question, a very specific content um, effect. The example that always comes to mind for me is very similar to what you described. I had Andy Shabilsky on the podcast a while ago, and, and he and some co-authors did a really interesting study along those lines where they said, you know, there's been some research that shows that playing violent video games causes people to display, you know, quote unquote, aggressive behaviors. And there's there's like a whole debate about whether those behaviors were truly aggressive or not, but they caused them to engage in certain behaviors or, be, or to go into certain mindsets, uh, psychological states. And their hypothesis was that you know, you can't have somebody play like a first person shooter and compare that person to a game, somebody playing Tetris, because yeah. in Tetris, you just got like four buttons or like, you know, a directional pad and a button. Whereas yeah. a first person shooter, like you have an entire keyboard potentially, and it's much more complex and it's, and it's harder. And their hypothesis was that, Hey, the difference between these two groups or, or the relevant difference isn't violent content or exposure to violent content, it's that the controls are frustrating and difficult. And mm -hmm. and they did some cool studies where they manipulated that and they they rigged up like a game of Tetris to be very difficult and frustrating to control and they found effects that they expected. And so like, hey, we thought that it was violence or violent you know, exposure to violent content and images, but really what it is is that you're thwarting these people's ability to be good at the game. And, and you're frustrating them. Right. 
yeah, Andy's Andy's and my work is um, quite similar in that regard. We we both um, we both uh, try to to manipulate um, games in a way that you know maintains most or yeah. Ideally, all of the factors um, constant across the two um, the two groups in your study, um, except the one factor you're interested in, and um, exactly as you described, Andy um, in Andy's study, they did some interesting um, manipulations of the controls. Mm -hmm. um, we manipulated in our studies. We manipulated um, first-person shooters. Um, in one study, we, for example, we manipulated uh, Unreal Tournament, and in another, um, we used Team Fortress 2. And we tried to create a non-violent version um, oh. of the game, so we were able to manipulate um, that factor and other factors that we thought were interesting. So how did you turn something like Team Fortress 2 into a non-violent game? Yeah, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Rainbow Blower. Um, in Team Fortress 2, it's a uh, it's, it's a weapon that weapons, comes, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a weapon that comes with the game, um, and the pyro basically has a has a trumpet, um, and he that it, that uh, fires rainbows um, <laughs> instead of fire. Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a joke, but it sounds like you're making better use of it here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it was a surprising surprising opportunity because before that we we had to do those kinds of manipulations ourselves, like we had to mod mod games with the modding tools. Um, available, but in that scenario, we were able to use um, something made by the developers of the game, which was um, obviously of high quality um, or equal quality to to the, the violent version. Mm -hmm. um, as professional game designers made it for us, and yeah, we used that um, we used that weapon. Um, we basically um, disabled all other weapons uh, in the game, so people were forced to use the rainbow blower in one condition and forced to use the um, regular. Um, uh, flamethrower in the other condition, um, and um, that was um, that worked pretty well because um, one of the effects uh, of the rainbow blower is then when you kill someone, um, they don't actually die; they 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 fall to the ground laughing. Right. Uh, um, and they, you, there's never any type of death animation, you could say. Um, so, with a very simple um, tool made available to us by the developer, we were um, able to create a let, let's say a lot less violent version of Team Fortress 2 than the original. Um, and then the other variable we, we manipulated was difficulty. So we, in kind of in a similar vein as Andy, we were also interested in whether um, uh, higher levels of difficulty might be um, might be causing um, players to to feel frustrated and to to increase um, feelings of anger uh, uh, in them. Mm -hmm. So um, we Quite simply, we, we just, in one condition, um, the opponents had very low health uh, health points, and in the other condition, they had quite, quite high health points, so it was harder to kill them, mm -hmm. um, the, the more difficult condition. Um, and yeah, that is um, that is how we try to go about the, the manipulation of um, of these experimental factors that we are interested in. Um, I think it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot cleaner way of studying... Um, Rivals interesting, uh, interesting to us. So what what did you find in those studies? Yeah, so uh, in those studies uh, we found um, no no effect at all, uh, no or no difference at all in terms of uh, aggressive behavior. Um, so the two the, the groups were not um, or the players were not influenced either by the display levels of violence or the difficulty. Um, they had some. Uh, they they definitely reported stronger feelings of um, uh, of frustration, um, and quite interestingly, we also found that um, depending on uh, uh, on the skills of the player, they they much much more enjoyed the, um, the the more difficult version than the easy version, which is also uh, I guess fairly obvious to most to most players. You, um, I mean, most players don't. Um, play games on the um, on the e the easiest level and to them. They they play uh, they play most games uh, on a, on a level that is that is challenging to them, but still doable um, uh, in a way. So that wasn't really um, surprising to us, but it was surprising to see that neither of the variables had any influence on the um, the aggression measurements, which is um, which we haven't talked about yet, but which is another big problem uh, in that type of effects research. How do you measure? How do you measure aggression? How do you how do you find out whether 
you know, manipulation did have an impact on, on players or not. Yeah, so let's let's talk about what that. What are some of the issues and, and problems and challenges that have to be dealt with there? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine, you can't you can't literally have people beat each other up in a laboratory um, uh, for ethical and legal reasons. Um, you need to make sure that nobody actually is harmed, um, including including the players themselves. Like they you. You wouldn't even be allowed to give them the opportunity to destroy an object because there would be a risk that they harm themselves while doing so. Right. Ethics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ethics and well, uh, also the law. Uh, in a way, sure. you're responsible for the people that, that come into your lab. Those two topics often intertwined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And yeah, sometimes. Um, so the researchers. Uh, I mean, this is this is a big, big limitation upfront to all to everybody to anybody that that wants to study aggression in the lab. Researchers try to be very creative about this and come up with scenarios that might be interpreted as aggression, mm -hmm. but don't really have these um, legal or ethical um, issues to them. So uh, one very popular instrument to measure aggression, aggressive behavior is the so-called competitive reaction time task. Um, it's Basically, it's designed as another simple game. So uh, your study participants are being told that after playing the first video game, they're going to play another much simpler video game where they compete um, against someone else uh, in a reaction time game. So basically they some sort of, they see some sort of signal uh, and they have to press a um, button as quickly as possible. And then um, in each round of that game, the winner gets to, gets to punish the loser with a noise blast, and they can um, they can set the intensity of that noise blast, so um, the volume and the duration. And um, it is research. Some research, researchers believe that um, this these noise settings um, are uh, um, a proper measure of aggressive behavior. Ah. So uh, the louder and longer the noise is, the winner sets for the loser, um, the more aggressive they are thought to be. Right. So it's like an unpleasant noise like a, a, a honking sound or yeah, honking or somebody scratching over um, a blackboard with their fingernails yeah. I guess they're unpleasant yeah. uh, definitely um, but as you as, as anybody can see it's not really the type of aggression that right. people are worried about in with regards to video games right um, they're more worried about getting in a fist fight or saying saying something hurtful or uh, yeah any of that type of stuff yeah, like sitting in a very safe environment, like a um, like a university laboratory, and sending an unknown stranger in the next room unpleasant mm -hmm. noise blasts is not something we usually ver worry about. Well, and not only that, but you have like the experimenter, or the person running the experimenter, giving you explicit permission to yeah. administer that yeah. noise blast, right? Yeah. So there's no, there's absolutely no, um, there's no fear of being reprimanded for it. There's no. Um, social disapproval um, by others. Um, so every all of these contingencies that we usually have that usually um, govern whether we are behaving aggressively or not. Like for example, um, our parents being disappointed in us when we get into a fight with someone, mm -hmm. um, or peers holding us back, um, maybe um, calming us down. All of these contingencies they don't exist in the laboratory naturally um, because it's a very artificial situation. But that, of course, um, again, causes a problem for the researcher because we want our research to be generalizable to the real world. We want to study something in the laboratory but still um, learn something about, the re about real life. This is, uh, I would probably say, the biggest challenge in the research on um, video games and aggression that um, nobody so far has come up with a scenario um, or um, procedure that would allow us to do that. Right. Yeah, I've seen people get really creative. Like it's, you know, a measure of aggression is how much hot sauce you add to somebody's food yeah. or... How oh, many needles they stuck into a voodoo doll. Right. Um, that's another, yeah. another measure. And, yeah. you know, these these types of procedures sound ridiculous. Like whether I talk to, to other researchers or to lay audiences, everybody laughs has to laugh when I tell them about these procedures. But this is what's happening in psychological laboratories 
um, where aggression is being studied. This is not some like small part of the research. This is the the, the lion's share. This is the the biggest part of the research is experimental laboratory research. So all of these um, all of these reviews, all of these meta analyses, all of these calls for policy change, they are based um, on this research, right? Uh, mostly based on this research. And I guess the same criticism holds for the the research that uh, looks at psychological states, like, oh, you recognized a word related to aggression more quickly than other types of words, for example, right. which right. then the researchers would ar might argue that that means that you're thinking about aggression or you're you're in an aggression right. an aggressive state, aggressive psychological state. Right. Right. So aggressive behavior is what most people are worried about, but then. Um, Researchers also study other aspects of aggression, like aggressive feelings um, mm -hmm. or uh, aggressive thoughts um, are um, believed to be um, important in the development of aggression. And of course, how, how do you measure thoughts? Uh, I mean, behavior at least can be observed. People can look at a behavior somebody is exhibiting and, and make a judgment. Is that behavior aggressive or not? Um, this is something people can observe and people can um, and can study by looking at the person, but thoughts um, and feelings cannot be studied that way, um, which makes it even harder, uh, in a way, um, to, to study them. So again, researchers get very creative um, and come up with you know procedures that they that they think um, tell us something uh, about what's going on inside inside video game players, uh, basically. So as, as you described, for example, they will show them um, a series of words. Um, and basically the idea is, and some of, the, some of the, these words are, have something to do with aggression or violence. For example, the word gun, or uh, the word punch, mm -hmm. or, uh, or, or the word kill. Um, and then other words have, have nothing to do with that. They, they are similar, um, like phonetically similar. For example, the word kiss is very similar to the word kill um, when written on a screen. Um, and then the idea is that if, if players are faster at detecting, at reading the word kill than the word kiss, they, um, the aggressive thoughts are more accessible to them. Right. Or at least that's how the argument goes, right? That, that's, that's the argument. That's the argument. Uh, that's the reason why they, why they study it. But in essence, um, it's, it's not very surprising that someone who literally just saw, witnessed <laughs> killing on a, on a screen for the last 15 minutes will um, have those concepts more accessible to them. Um, every, anything else, like, uh, if people were thinking about uh, flowers uh, after playing such video games, we, we would probably think that's pretty strange. We probably think that something is wrong with that person neurologically um, <laughs> because, um, I mean, why were they not thinking about the stuff they just saw and, and did, right? So so is that is that psychological priming? Is that the concept there? Yeah, that is psychological. That is, uh, it comes from the tradition of, uh, uh, of, uh, of psychological priming, exactly, which has been uh, under fire in, the, in recent years in, right. in psychology um, overall. Um, and um, video games research is no exception to that. So are there other uh, concepts that have similar problems? I, I don't know about you, but one of the most frequent questions I get when somebody learns that, like, I write about psychology in video games is, uh, like, oh, so those games are so addictive. Like, there, there's problems with addiction, and I don't want my kid to become addicted, or I don't want to become addicted. Right. Are, there, are there similar issues there? There are similar issues, although they are, of course, somewhat different because... Um, I hope most researchers would agree that you can't study addiction in the laboratory, that addiction is some kind of longitudinal process mm -hmm. that needs to develop over time. So at least in a way, they, <laughs> there's not that kind of silly lab research um, that people think generalizes to the real world. But there are other issues. Um, there are conceptual issues. What does it mean to be addicted to video games? Um, some researchers think it, it's sufficient that you play a lot, like somebody who plays eight hours a day, um, they would probably say that person's clearly addicted to, to video games. Right. Well, of course, if, if I if I have eight hours a day to spend, I I can choose freely. I can pretty much choose freely how I want to spend them. If it's eight hours of playing video games, and there's there are no other functional problems, like if I'm still 
eating and showering and have social contacts and going and go to, to work, work or school, yeah, whatever, then there's not really an issue here, right? So in some way, there's the problem that we, um, we're not very good at defining the kind of functional impairments that video games would have to cause to classify someone as addicted versus just enthusiastic about the games. Mm -hmm. Then there's other issues, which also have to do with the measurement uh, um, of, of addiction. Researchers come up basically, like each, each study on addiction has their own measurement for addiction. They all come up with their own questionnaire, their, their own survey instrument to classify someone. It's not only, those, it's not only the problem that they have their own criteria, um, they also develop new items constantly, new questions, new instruments to, to test for, um, for addiction. And these instruments are quite different from each other. And, um, comparing that to clinical research on, um, addiction to substances or, um, or gambling, for example, um, the, the differences become quite apparent. Um, because in those areas, um, most research try, most researchers try to agree on, on a measure to use. They try to, to find a consensus. Okay. This is the best measure that we have. Right. We're all going to use it now. It, it, there might be a better one a few years ahead, but for now, this is our gold standard. This is what we use to classify someone as addicted because we all agree that this is probably um, the best that we ha have available to us right now. And in video game addiction research, this is just not the case. Um, People are still tinkering. Um, I mean, even uh, even individual research groups change their me their measure from one study to another. Um, so, uh, in a way, it is very difficult to compare all those studies um, to to each other because they they might be testing for quite different different aspects um, uh, of something that could be um, could be uh, called video game um, addiction. Are there not like similar contexts where addiction is studied that video game researchers could just lift that stuff, like people addicted to, yeah. like you said, gambling or television or uh, any, you know, like any other kind of leisure activity or even like workaholics and people addicted to, to yeah. their work and that sort of stuff. It seems like it would be relatively straightforward to adapt those measures that item scales for other media the same problem exists there's no defined concept of television addiction right um most uh, or um of the few things that are recognized as a um as a diagnosis that are behavioral addictions um i guess gambling would be the closest to video game to, to video games right but there aren't mm. that many behavioral addictions um recognized as um, as psychological problems like the idea of something as video game addiction or television addiction is very much pop culture or very, very much everyday like my my parents would probably say you're addicted to the television but only very few uh, psychologists or psychiatrists would ever use that term because addiction is is a very serious um condition that needs to meet um uh, some kind of lowest standard to be recognized as, a, as an actual diagnosis that impairs or harms a, a person in real life. So the reason why gambling, mm -hmm. for example, um, is recognized as a, um, a psychological condition is that, it, is that the harm it causes is quite substantial, not, not only to the person itself, but also to that person's entire environment. Because most gamblers, unless they have unlimited funds will um, will uh, ask their family and their friends and others for money so the the the, the harm that they mm. cause uh, can be can be quite enormous they will probably also neglect their own family if they have and, and measurable too right like you can yeah you can, you can see when somebody it. has yeah. a huge debt and is not able to pay it back um, so and that's actually the reason why um, why gambling has uh, has made it in a way to the diagnostic manuals that we have, um, because the harm that it causes is is enormous. If if gambling wasn't about money, if gambling was about about time, maybe just maybe there wasn't any money involved. I don't think we would be talking about. It. I don't think that diagnosis would exist. It exists because we, because um, we have acknowledged that it's a it's a problem and that those people need treatment because um, they're hurting themselves, they're hurting others. 
in ways that are undesirable. And the same cannot be said for video games. Somebody, like, in extreme cases, of course it can. Like, uh, like let's say, um, somebody, someone with a, with a family that completely neglects, um, their, their partner or their kids, um, to play a video game. That would be worrying. Def- definitely worrying. But this is not, like, this is not what usually is meant when we talk about video game addiction. We mean someone who plays a lot. We mean someone who spends a lot of time with the medium. Maybe even someone who will not always do their homework and sometimes forget about social social obligations. Um, but this 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 is something entirely different from the problems caused by by someone that is actually addicted to gambling, much less to any substance it uses, mm-hmm. which is which is a whole another area, obviously. So is it just the case that we have the wrong label, that we're using the wrong word, and instead of addiction, we should be studying like uh, like engagement or motivation to keep playing or, or something along those lines? Um, I don't want to say that studying video game addiction is not, not a legit research area. You can – people can – Researchers can be worried about the problem, and maybe they they uh, like. I also know people who work in in um, in, in practice who work with um, adolescents and young adults that are uh, that have have that exhibit problems related to to video games. So there's there's something there. Um, the question is 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 is, is is well yeah, but is there something specific to video games that would um, justify Making it its own psychological condition, or is is uh, extreme excessive use of video games is just a symptom um, of of something else that we already have as a diagnosis, right? Maybe, mm-hmm. um, maybe. I mean, this and this is this is something that where I would love to see see more research comorbidity. So, are people that we would now Maybe classify as addicted to video games according to some um, instruments that we have. Are they also exhibiting other symptoms that we 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 can measure with um, more reliable tools, like for example, um, social anxieties or, or depression? Um, you know, the conditions that are mm-hmm. quite common. Uh, in fact, um, and this is this is an area where I would see a better. You know, future for for this for this this topic. I don't think like, I haven't seen a good argument what is special about video games in the way similar to what is special about gambling or special about um, what other behavioral um, problems that would justify making it its own category and not just a symptom um, or something that is underlying um, the problem. In fact, yeah, yeah, it sounds sounds complex and I guess still developing. You know, that's it's yeah, a research definitely. area that still people are still figuring it out. I mean, one one interesting part is in a lot of that research um, is um, we we are still lacking longitudinal um, mm. studies. Um, but of those longitud- longitudinal studies we have, it's it's a very apparent that uh, someone that according to a, a diagnostic instrument used in that study would be classified as addicted. If you measure that same if you, if you take that same person six months later and um, use that same measure, often it will be the case that a, a person diagnosed, in quotation marks, at point A would no longer be diagnosed at point B and vice versa. Ah. So there seems to be a bit of a, there's a bit of an instability in the diagnosis, um, which is uncommon for any other psychological condition or unreliability maybe in a more technical yeah, again, sense in a way in a way um the, the problem is not the unreli- unreliability of the measure is that the um criteria that we use to diagnose someone can easily change they are flexible so for example um uh let's uh let's take let's take somebody who plays eight hours a day in summer break right it's school or is over or the university is closed, they have nothing to do, they will play maybe eight hours a day, a new game comes out, yeah. they're going to play the shit out of that game. And then six months later, maybe, that's when exams are happening, right? So people are studying, they're no longer playing every day, maybe they're playing not at all, maybe they're playing just on the weekends. But 
someone who's able to to do that, somebody who's able to play in in times when they when they just have the resources to do it and regulate themselves in other times, um, that person is clearly not addicted. That yeah. person um, may, might be playing excessively or unusually often, but that person is not addicted. They are they are able to regulate themselves in that way. And this type of um, of variance um, within a person is something that is um, that I would say um, is, would be quite unusual for a clinical diagnosis. And this is also uh, suggesting that that whatever we think um, is a good definition of video game addiction might not work out. Right. It sort of argues for a trait versus state definition yeah. Uh, yeah. where, you know, if circumstances are right, then they go into a state, you know, where they're they're playing excessively and so forth. But it's not necessarily something inherent. It's not necessarily yeah. a trait of that person that they are a, prone to addiction to these games. Right. Exactly. Or maybe it is. And both the situation and the trait interact with each other or moderate. Sure. One moderates the other. Sure. But if it's literally a state, if they can, if it's if it's all according to the situation if it's all if it's all happening um, because uh, because it's possible because the resources are there because there are no other obligations then that person doesn't have a problem you know to me like unless the person has unless i mean they're neglecting their social life etc cetera, etc cetera. but if they if they if, if people are just playing when they have a lot of time on their hands anyway what are we talking about so you know we talked about the fact that you need to have good study designs you need to have good conceptualizations of your your outcomes and your all of your variables and things that you're measuring how do you sort of take the next step to communicate the research that's done uh, to the world outside of the lab you know one of my uh, graduate school advisors like one of their favorite sayings was that research is not complete until it's communicated to the rest of the world yeah so how do people doing research on games and, and related topics, like how do they move that from the lab to the larger social context? Yeah, that is, that is a big concern in, um, in video games research because you have a lot of um, alarmist statements made publicly, um, a lot of um, insinuations or uh, suggestions that video games that there's scientific evidence that video games might be contributing to to violent crime, um, mm -hmm. to shootings, uh, for example, that might be a driving cause in such extreme um, extreme um, behaviors, which again is based on very simple, very abstract laboratory research, and that is that is something um, we have seen for for a long time. Um, researchers engaging in what is basically a moral, a moral panic um, <laughs> that yeah. they are contributing to, um, to a public image of, um, of the research on video games that is just not accurate. Like I'm, I'm not saying that video games might not be a cause in, in aggression. We, we don't have evidence, well, we don't have a lot of evidence to the contrary as well. Um, but the evidence that, that says so is very thin as well. So if we're talking about the science of it, the fair characterization would be that we don't know, but it doesn't look like it's a big issue. Uh, in uh, terms of that the, is not a very interesting newspaper headline. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, it's, and it also doesn't help you uh, in if you need uh, grant proposals. Right? Exactly. If you, if you need grant money. No, right. of course. I mean... Researchers have invested their careers in that in that topic, and coming up now and saying, "Well, maybe we wasted," or I'm not say wasted, but maybe took a took an extreme position in the last year, in the last thirty years that wasn't justified by data. This is something. Uh, I mean, if somebody would do it, it would be it would be admirable, um, mm -hmm. of course, because that's what what we expect of scientists. We expect that scientists correct their belief according to scientific data. That's that's part of the scientific process, right? Yeah, right. So, um, and um, but this is this is just not happening. Um, we instead we have camps that are uh, entrenched and that will that are fighting with each other, other and that have been fighting with, with each other for the past I don't know fifteen years or so, uh, maybe even longer. And and it's not just the aggression question either. You see 
uh, headlines about research saying like, oh, kids that play video games don't do as well in school or they don't do as well yeah. socially, all those types of things. And that, there does seem to be a lot of headlines targeted at kids. And maybe that's just because that's what we react to, you know, and what we click through on. Um, but yeah, there does seem to be a lot of that going on. But so how can people like yourself and, and other researchers sort of get involved and, and temper those types of inappropriate reactions? <laughs> or am I asking um, too much? <laughs> no, but I mean, um, or is that even your job? The answer, the answer is very simple. You know, just be honest to the public about the state of the art. Um, but of course, that's an advice not pe not many or uh, and that's wrong. But that's an advice that some aren't following anyway. Uh, and uh, telling them again uh, on your show won't change that, right? So um, scientists are expected to inform the public accurately about the state of the research. Mm -hmm. As long as we do that, it's fine. Um, but engaging in hyperbole, as as researchers have done um, for quite a while, media in general and particularly about um, about video games, um, it's just not helping anymore. And if you're, I mean, I, I, the thing is, I'm not even sure, or I actually don't think there's any ill intent um, behind it. I, I think most of the of the researchers that, um, that are worried about the effects of, of video games want to make the world better. But somewhere on, on that way, they I think they, they lost track um, of of the the impact, uh, the negative, the potential negative impact video games can possibly have on, on the world, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I hope I, I'm I hope and I'm actually quite confident this this will change. I see um, a lot of young researchers doing it much better, uh, doing it much more accurate. Even though um, they might personally believe that playing video games is harmful. And uh, maybe they even have data that suggests so, but they're much more conservative in communicating that to peers and to 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 the public. Right. And if we have reached a point where we can talk about research like adults again, um, I'm actually quite happy. Uh, I don't. Uh, I I'm perfectly fine discussing the possibility um, of, of harmful video game effects with somebody, um, but. Uh, I don't like to be called a creationist um, for for doubting uh, that this might be the case, right? And, right. So, are there any ideas uh, or assumptions about the psychology of video games that you think we just need to to completely get rid of or or start over from scratch and in, in evaluating them? Yeah, um, video games are first and foremost a toy. They're a digital toy, mm -hmm. and we don't have these kind of worries about other toys. Um, I mean, even toys that are that kind of look martial, I guess, uh, that that feature guns and all of that stuff. Parents aren't usually worried about that. That stuff. they might not like it. They might not want their kids to play with or to play cowboy, for example. Mm -hmm. But they, there's no public debate uh, about playing cowboy for for Halloween or uh, or sports like football yeah. or soccer or any of those types of things, yeah. And what we need to be clear on is that video games are a digital toy. And there might be, I'm not saying that they're necessarily harmless because of, because of that, but this is the basic premise. You have a digital toy, and then you can start looking at whether they it might be different from other toys. It might have some effects that we don't want. Um, that we wouldn't want in in society, uh, or that it might facilitate some of them. Um, for example, a, a research line that I very very much uh, think um, uh, or shows us that there are things we need to worry about video games is um, is the type of language video game players use mm. uh, in multiplayer games. Right? They um, they there are a lot of uh, racist or sexist comments and behaviors uh, yeah. in those in those multiplayer platforms and this is something that I'm, I'm definitely worried about but this is not specific to video games people are just assholes anywhere <laughs> yeah. um, but of course video I've games seen it. yep <laughs> yeah so uh, and I, I, I guess everybody has seen it everybody has met somebody online that was a dick um, but this is not caused by video games it's just that video games allow it right or very easily um, to 
to to behave that way, and this is something I can I can see uh, people being worried about. But um, if you, if we're talking about a simple stimulus response model, so people playing a game using a digital toy and therefore showing extreme types of of responses, like acting aggressively, acting violently, this is something we need to get rid of. This idea that that a simple stimulus like a game could fundamentally change human nature and all of the other influences that we that we are under every day, right? I mean, even even if games, even assuming that games might have something like a harmful effect, a negative effect, driving you towards acting aggressively, what about all the other influences that usually prevent you from doing so? Like mm-hmm. if I if I were starting to if I let's let's imagine I'm a ten year old boy and I'm starting out acting more and more aggressively because of video games. What about my parents? What about my peers? Aren't they going to do something about it? Right? I mean, those other influences are also right. there, and they're usually pretty good at intervening that kind of stuff. And if they're not, if if nothing happens, if there's no intervention, if nobody notices. I'm behaving differently, then maybe that's where the actual problem lies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point that there are lots of uh, factors that that push back against uh, aggressive or violent behavior, yeah. uh, and the things that prevent you and and understanding that there will be consequences that are not present in the laboratory study that you maybe just got out of half hour ago. Um, this seems to be a point that's over overlooked a lot. Yeah. I get maybe once every week or two, I get an email from somebody who says like, hey, I'm an undergraduate student at such and such university, and I think this idea of studying psychology and video games is, is totally awesome, and I want to do that. And, you know, and they ask, like, how do I do that? <laughs> you know, like, what can I do? Uh, and it occurs to me that you may be in some ways a better person to answer this question. So so I'll toss it over to you. Like, what what advice do you have for students who want a career studying uh, video games in a scientific or academic context? Like, what should they be doing as students or you know, early on to help them land a job doing that and in order to do it well once they start? I mean, there's, I only have obvious answers. Read, read as much as you can. Yeah. Read, read all of, of the things um, that you find interesting about, about video games. And I don't mean, I don't mean read Wired and read Kotaku. I mean, read scientific research and, Ask yourself whether this is what you, what you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, mm. uh, basically, video games is a is a relatively young video games research is a relatively young field, but we have there are many branches. Um, of, you can do more of the um, psychological effects research that that I'm uh, that I'm doing, but there are many many different branches that. That exist in the humanities, of course. People um, doing research on video games uh, as an art form mm-hmm. uh, or, as a, or as a cultural artifact, um, which has nothing to do with, with games. So um, right. there are many different branches, and the idea of studying video games as a whole is usually beyond human capacity. <laughs> so you got to specialize, huh? Well, you need to. Yeah, I mean, you, at least need some kind of you know basic research question that drives that underlies all of all of what you do mm-hmm. if your research question is i want to know how how people understand video games this is going i don't think this is going to lead you anywhere because it's it's a way to to broad question um to ask so um but then again reading the literature that is available it can help you in shaping in shaping a much more uh, nuanced question that you have. Mm-hmm. And then you find out whether somebody else has answered it, and if not, do it. Um, you, can, you can do it. Um, get in touch. Uh, the good thing about video games um, researchers is that m- many of them are young and open, and you can... Uh, I only know very few researchers that would be offended by, by, uh, by a young person reaching out to them and telling them they, they want to study video games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most of the ones I've encountered seem pretty open to it as well. Yeah, and, and if you're young, you want to publish, you want to, you want to do research, you want to, you know, build your career. So, yeah. any, any opportunity is a good opportunity. 
Yeah, definitely. But also, um, in a way, I kind of regret that I started doing it. Um, no. Now, looking looking back, um, I kind of I kind of feel like I could have done something that is meaningful, mean, more meaningful um, than what I'm what I have done in the past. Um, it's it's kind of hard to describe because um, I mean. Uh, as I just said, video games are primarily a toy. So what do we do? We study toys. That's not really helping anyone, right? I mean, mm. it, it might indirectly, eventually, at one point. But, of course, there are much more urgent urgent questions um, to be answered. Um, and in a way, yeah. I feel like I, um, I was, I was de- personally, I was definitely driven towards video games research um, mm. because uh, I like video games personally. And I thought that it would be a good idea to combine these personal interests with a with a um, with a career. Mm-hmm. Um, and now looking back, I'm thinking that if I could, if I could uh, reconsider that decision, I might actually have done. Uh, I have studied something something else. Yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. You're not you're not learning how to cure a disease or yeah. or increase uh, you know the the wealth or the happiness of of somebody or or doing research that helps people learn new skills or be better people or some of that. But I don't know. I, I wouldn't sell yourself too short. I think as a field, you know, understanding the, the psychological roots and uh, of games helps make better games and, and have better gaming experiences. And games are as important as any other form of expression and pastime. And they make people happy. And, and if yeah. you can figure out how to make them so that they can, serve other purposes like education or, you know, gamifying experiences to get people more involved in the political process, for example. There's a lot of avenues that you can do pretty meaningful. Sure. I I, I don't mean to tell you you're wrong or anything. No, 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 no. (laughs) I'm glad you're you're doing what you're doing. uh, You're absolutely right that it's, um, uh, that you can, you can definitely apply a lot, a lot of ideas that originate from games to other areas in in life. Mm -hmm. Um, That's definitely true. I didn't. And I didn't mean to. I didn't. I didn't mean to say that people should stop studying video games. Yeah, I it's didn't. just a. I, that's not what just I heard. A, um, I, 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 I myself see a lot of young people, um, a lot of um, undergrads being excited about the idea of studying something they love, personally very very much uh, that they that they spend a lot of time with, and but this is not a very good motivator right. to to have a. Um, long-term sustainable career yeah you see a lot of people say that about making games as well you know i I want to be a game designer i want to make games and it's like okay well then you need to learn how to code or do uh, create art or do project management or you know any of these direct skills and i can see a parallel there with people saying like i want to understand games i want to study games it's like okay well you need to learn research methods data uh, it's mani- manipulation and statistics and you know all these other things that right. like man that's boring all i want to do is like talk yeah. about games <laughs> it's like it, well it doesn't it, work it, that way it is boring but the 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 amazing thing is once you have learned that stuff you also realize that you could answer a lot more interesting questions with mm-hmm. it than understanding video games or i don't want to say more interesting but there the the your horizon of possible subjects to study with those tools that you acquired um, just gets larger and larger. Yeah, so, and, and there are plenty of researchers out there who, you know, video games is only one aspect of what they study. Like, they'll look at broader yeah. contexts and, and other subjects. And, and throughout their career, I imagine they may move amongst various different topics. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So... Um, I don't want to keep you much longer. This is a lot of really interesting stuff, and it's it's interesting to hear it described and talked about in such concrete terms. Um, so I, I very much appreciate that. So a couple of questions to kind of wrap things up. First one is, have you been playing any games lately? Have you had any time to do that? <laughs> um, I, I did. Um, I, was, um, I was on vacation in Corsica um, oh, nice. a couple of weeks, or weeks back, um, and that kind of... Uh, caused me to pick up um, Crusader Kings 2 again, play as the nation of Corsica. Um, okay. And I did that for two weeks, and then I basically put it back on the shelf. Yeah, I've never played any of those games, but from what I understand, they're very deep. 
and and you can they're lose a lot good. of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're, they're pretty good. I did that. Um, I used to play a lot of Team Fortress, but my my regulars have all have all gone to Overwatch. Yep. And I haven't I haven't brought myself to buy it yet. But oh, it's good. I, you should buy it. I think I'm going to do it. Yeah. You should, you should yeah, play yeah. it. I, I S- send me your friend request on Battle.net. I'll I'll hook you up. <laughs> Okay. It's it's okay. good and it it is an easy transition from from TF2 to to the Overwatch because it's the same the same bones, you know, it's yeah, the yeah. same basic kind of game but it's just newer and more polished and Blizzard is is really good at making video games it yeah, turns yeah, out yeah. and and yeah. they they have a lot of things figured out. Uh, so yeah, I guess that'll be I will I will be playing that in the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. Uh yeah, I I've been playing a lot of Overwatch myself. Uh, it's it's sort of my you know I've got thirty minutes to to spare. You know I'll play a couple mm-hmm. of couple of matches, couple of rounds. Yeah. Um, but I've also been playing uh, Just Cause Three, which is like an mm-hmm. open world uh, action game uh, where yeah. you, you blow up a lot of stuff and you're yeah, playing... I, I played Just Cause Two. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's not very different from that one. Nope. It's it's Just Cause Two with <laughs> okay. like more stuff to okay, blow up yeah. and, and new toys and. Now on the new platform, on the uh, playing it on the yeah. PS4, uh, so I'm I'm enjoying that quite a lot. Uh, but yeah, so if somebody wanted to find out more about you and your research, uh, where would they go on the internet to do that? Well, I have a website. It's very cool. Uh, it's got like a Pac-Man motif. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I have that website. Uh, people can go to. Maybe you can put a link uh, on your podcast. Um, I absolutely will. If yeah. If anybody's interested, I also I have a Twitter account. Um, but fair warning, I don't tweet a lot about video games anymore mm-hmm. it's more about really um it's about psychological research research methods in a much more abstract way um, but people can can definitely um get, get a good impression of what i'm doing now um there um so yeah okay um, i'll put links to both of those up in the the blog post and the the podcast notes that go with this episode well thanks thanks for coming on it's a lot of really great stuff i'm yeah thank you for inviting me All right, thanks. Hey, you made it. You're here at the end of the podcast. Nice. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed having that discussion. So make sure to go to psychologyofgames.com where you can find out how to subscribe to the website and subscribe to the podcast and follow or contact me on various social media. And the other thing you ought to do is go check out patreon.com slash POG so that you can help uh, support me and make sure that other episodes of the podcast are forthcoming. Speaking of which, in the next episode, I'm going to have a really cool conversation about motivations behind playing video games. Why do we like to play games? And some of the most uh, well-established research about gaming motivations. Uh, Plus, we'll get into a little bit about how that applies to No Man's Sky and a few other different games. It's going to be cool. I'll see you then.